one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, and with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Jesus has been in Jerusalem for a week. And the Pharisees, Sadducees, elders, the religious people are out to trip him up, out to entrap him. So let me give you a paradox. Jesus versus religion. How's that for a strange idea? And in Matthew 22, where the story is told, we have the words beginning with, the Pharisees, having seen that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, assembled together. Don't you know, we human beings like to get together in little groups to connive and to manipulate, to backstab and plot and all these dark things that are so ungodly. May they not happen in a church. And to show you how Scripture is so marvelous, so full of divine wisdom, it's like a prism where different colors can be caught at different angles. In Matthew, we find that the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the scholars, the ones who have it right, are going to find a way to get them. But here in Mark, we have a slightly different perspective. Did you see how the scribe, who's a scholar of the law, a lawyer, not just a writer, seeing that he answered rightly, goes to him. So this is the different angle of the prism. This is a scholar who knows the law, who realizes that someone before him just might have an answer for the hunger in his soul. Because knowing the law, knowing Moses' teachings about God is not enough. Sometimes knowledge is not enough. And that's part of the teaching here today. I want to remind you that the chosen people, those who gave monotheism to the world, who left child sacrifice behind and led us on a journey of enlightened understanding, had developed through their priests 613 laws. 365 were prohibitions, thou shalt not. 248 were thou shalt do this. And the scholars knew them all, and they figured he might get 612 wrong, you see, if they ask him the question right. So there was a good chance they could get him on a technicality. Because their religion had been reduced to proper ritual, proper theology, proper doctrine, pro proper memorization, and the spirit was gone. Now the prophets knew this way back when. We have Hosea saying in his wild man ways, I prefer mercy, not sacrifice. And by sacrifice, he means the proper way to conduct worship in those times, according to cultic law. We have Isaiah saying, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
Now let's not get the idea he's talking about Israelites long ago who got confused and lost. He's talking about you and me right now, today, in those pews. Is your heart far from God while you worship God? Is there hate? Is there division? Is there unrighteousness that is behavior unpleasing to God right now? Are you a Pharisee who wants to make sure that we get it right or else? Then listen to Jesus because this is a message for each one of us today. When Jesus says, Hear, O Israel. Understand he's not talking to a nation as I told the children. He's talking to the remnant. He's talking to you and me. He's talking to us in this day and age who need God, who hunger for God, who believe in God in spite of the culture, the pressure, the peers. Hear, you who love God. The Lord our God is one. Ekad is the Hebrew word. It not only means one, it means reliable. The Lord our God is reliable. So that you shall rely on Him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. In Hebrew, the heart is the center of your being. Of course, the soul is the willpower to do so. And you might think, well, this is a no-brainer. That's obviously the number one law. But think about this. Religion has all these obligations and requirements, and Jesus is leaping over them to the key thing. Jesus is the same one who said, it doesn't matter what goes into your mouth, but what comes out. He breaks all the kosher laws, all the dietary laws, the very identity of what it means to be Jewish and Hebrew. It's blasphemy to them. But Jesus came to upset the apple cart. Louis Everly, the Belgian priest, says, Jesus did not come to create a new religion. He came to give us direct access to God. Past all of the mumbo-jumbo and the human-made creeds and the us-against-them thing and all of that oh-so-human stuff that has made religion such a disaster in human history. The Lord our God is one. What is the implication of God's oneness? Friends, it's quantum physics. It means that if God is one, we are one. Reality is all interconnected. I may be up here and you may be over there. I may have a funny accent and you may speak right, but we're all interconnected in subatomic levels. The Lord our God is one, we are one. And when we proclaim God's oneness, we proclaim our unity in spite of all the things set up to separate us. You shall love Him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. You know, some folks love God emotionally, and that's a wonderful thing. They get goosebumps at our beautiful music, or they go to some big mega church with all kinds of instruments and wow, feel great when they leave. But what happens when the high is over and they come down? You know what happens? They're just tired then. You see, to love God just emotionally is an up and down thing. It has to be part of a bigger whole with all your. And that all in Greek is holos. Meaning, meaning holistically, with all different sides of you. We've got people who love God intellectually, don't you know? They've read every book you can get your hands on. They're encyclopedias of religious information. But like that scribe, they do not know God. They do not have relationship with living spirit. It's like the person who reads all about flying, but has never flown a plane. Do you want to get on that plane? You see the difference? And each of us is guilty in our own way, because each of us has our particular kind of way to deal with life, intellectually, emotionally, physically. All of it together is the worship of God, is consciousness of God, is following Christ's way. 
You see, one of the things we realize in this teaching is that this book here is not just one thing. On the American frontier, something happened in Christian history, something called bibliolatry, where the book became a magic book. And the worship was of the book, not of the Spirit revealed through the book. And Jesus calls us to have discernment because this early section here with the God of the Hebrews who wanted to kill the children of the Canaanite is an earlier understanding of the God revealed by Jesus. We went from that child sacrifice and letting that go to worshiping at the high places, to sacrificing animals, and finally to ultimate awakening to reality of God through Christ. You see, we need to look at this through the eyes of Christ. When we don't, when we take it all the same, we fail to understand what he tells us today. That none of those 613 sacred laws matter if we don't love the Lord our God with all heart, mind, and soul in such a way that we are transformed. And how easy, how human it is to reduce religion to doing certain acts, certain things properly so that we can feel good about ourselves. You see, in those ancient days, the Hebrews, with all their laws, they figured if we get this many right and this many wrong, if we can balance that out, we'll be okay in the long run, sort of playing math with God. And Jesus, the radical, called us to all or nothing. And then he tells us about that second teaching, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's not take that so easily and quickly. This comes out of Leviticus, Leviticus 19.18. That's where it's mentioned. That's where Jesus gets it from. It's the only other time. And it's mentioned in this verse, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And that follows dealing with your brother and dealing with your children. And modern-day Hebrew teachers will tell you that that word neighbor in Leviticus is reyaka, which means close companion, sometimes spouse. They claim that it does not mean universally everyone. And so they translate it, love your, parentheses, fellow Jew neighbor. Love your family, love your tribe. You see how in those days it hadn't reached the enlightenment of the Christ. That's why the Christ had to come. That's why the prophets were pushing further and further towards that time of true enlightenment and awakening to God's call on our lives. The Hebrew scholars tell us that Sachem is the word for neighbor and it's not listed there. So, in the Old Testament, love your neighbor was love your fellow villager. And we know through the Good Samaritan and all the teachings of Christ that when he says love your neighbor, he means every human being. But more than that, it's not as we might expect, well, I love myself, so I will love you a little too. That's pretty sad theology, don't you think? That's pretty second rate. It's an analogy. Okay, since I love myself, I can love you too. This is what Jesus is saying. Love your neighbor as though he or she were yourself. See that which is divine in the other person as the divine is within you. See that oneness of God in that other person and in you. That's a whole other thing, don't you think? That's the Christ Spirit awakened in humanity. That's breaking through the boundaries of us against them, of primitive thinking, of separation. That's radical living. That's seeing the divine everywhere. You know, the Hebrews in their growing process spoke of fragments of the divine broken like a mirror in creation and our job was to recognize it and pull it together. But still, the neighbor was your fellow Jew. 
not the Gentile. And it took this extraordinary, totally transforming way of Christ that couldn't be held in a box, couldn't be held in a religion, couldn't be held in laws to break through. He not only fulfills the laws, he transforms them so that what matters is unconditional love. Coming through us so that we might be benediction, blessing to the world, children of God, alive and well and conscious of God. That's the religion Jesus brought. Linking us, relinking us to spirit, that's what religion means. So beyond all the structures and the dogmas and the rules and the theologies is the one thing that matters. The compass that Jesus gives us today. And as it says in our scripture, they dared not ask him any more questions after that. Those waters were too deep. May you enter these deep waters today. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help us to hear your words. Help us to receive them within, to be changed by them, to be challenged by them, to be renewed by them. We pray this in your holy and powerful and living name. Amen.